This is a crusade. This is a holy war against the deep state. Where are the dictators? Where are the strong men? Donald Trump is our instrument for retribution. I'm going to fight for Christians. I'm going to fight for white people. They have the great reset. We have the great awakening. And why shouldn't I root for Russia? Because Which I am. I want to see these people go through misery because of their grooming against our children. After the assailant entered the home asking, where's Nancy? Where's Nancy? Those are the very same words used by the mob when they stormed the United States Capitol. I did nothing wrong. Welcome to the Did Nothing Wrong podcast, where we cut through the noise and help you make sense of the chaotic information space around us. I'm Griff Somke. And I'm Jay McKenzie. Bjorn Eiler's life changed forever on July 22nd, 2011. That was the day he came face to face with mass killer Andres Breivik, who was in the middle of carrying out the worst mass shooting in Norway's history. Since then, Bjorn has become a peace activist, working with the Khalifa Eiler Institute and Glitter Pill, and has dedicated his life to ending violence and promoting understanding between peoples. We are very fortunate to have him with us today. Bjorn, thanks for being here, and welcome to Did Nothing Wrong. Well, thanks for having me. Can you tell us about yourself and the work that you do? Uh, that's a very broad and general question, but mm-hmm. uh, uh, I'm uh, Bjorn Eiler. I'm uh, one of the co-founders of the Khalifa Eiler Institute uh, and of uh, Glitter Pill LLC. Um, the Khalifa Eiler Institute started off in 2016, uh, building off of uh, me and my partner's work um, in you know, the peace and restorative justice space and, and worked a lot through that and also counter extremism and then got uh, more heavily involved in um, the online aspects of that, um, in particular through the Global Internet Forum to Counter Terrorism, for which I chaired the advisory committee for the first uh, couple of years. That was uh, an independent organization. And then when I stepped down from that, decided to start Glitter Pill uh, along with uh, Samantha Kettner as uh, a company um, to basically provide um, OSINT services and uh, work on you know, threat assessments and understanding extremist networks uh, and how they are abusing various tools and services for recruitment, for spread of propaganda, and for, for coordination um, in between them and, and assisting companies in taking um, those problematic networks uh, down really in, in as effective ways as possible. We've had Samantha on the show before, and she's been absolutely wonderful in the work that yeah. she's doing. She's been great. How did you guys end up meeting? How did you guys end up starting to work together? Uh, so we met, uh, I think, in 2019 online. Um, so after uh, the Christchurch shooting, uh, a fellow researcher uh, set up a uh, kind of DM channel on Twitter of all places uh, <laughs> for people in in the research uh, space who've been working on on extremism. And Samantha had at that point been working a lot on the Proud Boys, and I've been working a lot uh, over here in Europe on various things as well as uh, in North America. And so we're kind of thrown into this group with I don't know like. 30 people from various um, academic institutions, etc. And we learned about each other's work, one of, of the pieces of work that I was deeply engaged in at that time and still am is um, uh, what's called the, the hate map, where we try to, to map out uh, far-right uh, incidents globally. Sam on her side had been working a lot on um, a map that is specific to the Proud Boys in the U.S. And uh, we had a bit more you know, of the infrastructure that was needed to to make that work. And so um, we put our heads together and uh, built out the Proud Boys map, uh, really, and then also more on the hate map side of things. And that led us to the point where we were asked to provide evidence for the January 6th Select Committee. And last year provided kind of a written report uh, to the committee based on our research on on the group and uh, both their behaviors um, before, during, and after um, January 6th storming of the Capitol. And yeah, that was really kind of through that um, we joined forces. And then when starting Glitter Pill, figured out kind of how we can instrumentalize uh, some of those um, good vibes in our working <laughs> relationship uh, right. and bring that to create some real impact uh, across kind of counter extremism, counter terrorism, uh, both in the US, uh, in Europe and globally, really. Yeah, it's wonderful and remarkable who you can meet online. And Griff and I 
haven't actually met in person. We have uh, only been talking on Twitter for the last six years and, right. and decided to do this together. It is is or was a great uh, incubator for that sort of thing. And and that's really cool that you guys came together that way. Yeah, I mean, uh, at this point, we, we still have team members that I've never met in person working for, for Glitterpill these days. And uh, it's really remarkable that we are going to be able to run... Uh, 24 hours a day, five days a week um, at this point um, with a team all over the world who have uh, various degrees of expertise uh, within their specific regions. And um, so we can really benefit from um, having a global network, trying to map out these global networks of extremists as well um, and rely a lot on on the regional expertise and experience from from so many people from uh, all sorts of different places that... uh, I haven't been able to visit yet, but hope to hope to be able to go at some point and meet with them. Definitely, definitely. Well, I wanted to ask you, and I hope I'm pronouncing this correctly, but you are the co-founder of the Khalifa Eiler Institute, and your your mission statement there is to work towards the implementation of policy that build towards our vision of peaceful, inclusive, and thriving communities around the world. And that is a, a great goal and, and absolutely support what you're doing there. But when you see what's happening in Israel and Gaza right now, how do, how do you keep working towards that goal when there's so much awful chaos and, and death surrounding us every day? I think, um, yeah, there's always been chaos and that surrounding us in so many ways, right? Uh, this escalation in, in Gaza and Israel is obviously terrible, but it also kind of adds to a world that's um, been more or less constantly in in uh, various war scenarios uh, forever. And so really our work there, um, it's largely about finding those those forces for, for good, the forces that are working for uh, peaceful, inclusive, and thriving communities and helping elevate that. And so a lot of our work has been um, in uh, North Africa in particular, working with um, youth voices in Tunisia and Libya, working with um, women's rights, working with indigenous people's rights and the preservation of indigenous people's uh, cultural heritage, etc. because Ultimately, our understanding of violent extremism is rooted in this idea of the violent denial of diversity, which is universal um, and across across the globe and across various extremist organizations, etc. It's also um, kind of very common in war scenarios. This idea that um, like these people shouldn't be here um, and we need to <laughs> exterminate them is kind of a, a recurring theme across uh, many of the evils of the world. And so we're really working to counteract that um, in as many uh, good ways as possible by really highlighting our shared humanity um, across these perceived divides. So when we, we have a conflict like this and there's so much going wrong and so much fear and uncertainty and, and there is this genocidal rhetoric that gets tossed around by government officials and it's and it's scary and it's concerning do you look at an event like this and and think well this is kind of a breeding ground for future extremists are you are you looking at it and and planning out you know what may come of this the aftershocks of this is that going to directly affect your work uh i I think the natural answer to that is yes it will affect our work um i think in many ways, it's hard to really see where things are going in the heat of the moment. Like this escalation um, builds on so many years of conflict uh, in the region and so many previous escalations as well, right? And so seeing the outcome at this point um, is really hard and where that will will be going. I think one thing we're, we're you know, looking at is the fundamentals of some sort of shared humanity, some sort of shared reality. And in particular, in what uh, we've been observing online for the last couple of weeks um, has been really disturbing to some extent in that the institutions that are supposed to hold some sort of truth um, have largely been failing at that. And and we've seen that for a number of years across different conflicts, right, Where, where misinformation and where propaganda of different sorts and flavors um, play a massive role, but it's been very 
you know, tangible, um, I would say in particular in, in this conflict, that um, the basis for our understanding of the reality of um, what is happening on the ground is non-existent, basically. And we've seen reputable media organizations fall into the traps of, of uh, reporting um, various uh, sources that turned out to be um, sharing things that were less than true and, and right. so on and so forth. And so what that does to um, society at large, um, both in the region and, and across the world, is really you know, shatter the sense that um, we can trust um, any of these institutions but also that we trust in the fact that there is some sort of reality somewhere. And that mistrust and that uh, lack of sense of shared reality um, really becomes a breeding ground for for future tensions and conflicts. And we're already seeing that also manifest in you know, people lashing out in other parts of the world, right? We've seen attacks on Muslim children outside of Chicago. That was really disturbing. Um, last week, um, we've seen attacks on, on synagogues. We've seen attacks on mosques um, around the world uh, in light of what's been going on. And so the ripple effects here are also really concerning and really kind of adds to to this kind of violent denial of diversity, as we call it. Um, right. and, and we're seeing a lot of that at the moment as well. One of the ripple effects that we also seem to be seeing is that the people who are traditionally fact checkers in this field seem to be just completely overwhelmed at the yeah. sheer amount of just bullshit that's gone on in this. Do you think we are almost past a point where fact checking is a viable strategy for dealing with this sort of misinformation? Because it sort of seems almost like we're there right now. Uh, yeah, I mean, Cheyenne from BBC has been doing a pretty brilliant job. Um, right. I know you guys are probably in, in touch with him in some oh, way. Oh, we've had him on. Yeah, we love, but, we love Cheyenne. He's great. Yeah. Uh, but but uh, despite his best efforts, I think he's on day 18 at this point of, of mm -hmm. long threads on X, Twitter, uh, whatever we're calling it today, and, and his fact-checking mission and... Um, like him and other people are doing good work, but there's, um, as you say, this overwhelm. And I think this kind of harkens back to things we've been seeing for quite some time. I remember back in 2016 during the U.S. election campaigns as well, that there was this sense of really a lack of um, common ground when it came to what the sense of the political reality within the U.S. was. And that was also something we noticed really observing the discourse within the US from abroad, as I a lot of the time have the privilege of doing. And at that point as well, there was um, so much influence uh, exerted from various state actors and non-state actors um, around the globe um, that really kind of tore apart kind of this fabric of, of reality as well. And already at that point, this was overwhelming for so many of the uh, fact checkers of the world. And like fact checking kind of became a thing during that era as well. And it was pretty evident from the start of that, that this was basically trying to build a dam by putting a rock in the river um, yeah. to some extent. And so um, one question I think we need to, to ask based on that is really like rather than necessarily going down the routes of uh, trying to whack the balls of fact checking right. um, build uh, trustworthy and trustful like media institutions again and that's a really hard task and a, and then a big um, ask as well especially um, considering some of the financial models surrounding media, et cetera, that uh, poses challenges um, and had really kind of posed some big challenges in the mid 2010s as well um, that led to some of that. And so um, I don't have any simple answers, but good journalism sure. is yeah. uh, always uh, in short supply and something that definitely needs more resources allotted to it. And I think um, ultimately it's, a resourcing problem across the board, both when it comes to enough research sources for researchers and, and fact checkers, but also when it comes to resources for um, good journalism and for building trustworthy uh, media institutions that can uncover some of that shared reality and be um, trusted not just on uh, news clip to news clip or story to story level, but at an institutional level as well.
And I think also getting people to appreciate what good journalism means and what good journalism can do for you is also another critical thing that we should work on, getting people to oh, yeah. understand that you want things to work a certain way. You want a shared reality. We need to agree on what that shared reality prevents and what that shared reality can can bring. Yeah, and the shared reality is not always going to cater to your biases. Right. right. <laughs> so no. like, we need to open ourselves up as well to understanding that there might be things that are conflicting with like what our kind of pre-negotiated sense of reality would be um, right and in that there's a lot of, of things to be discussed about how informational literacy etc is being taught even in classrooms but also how we are you know, spreading that sense of epistemological curiosity uh in the grown-up population as well so you're focused and based primarily in Europe, and I do wonder if there are things that Europe is getting right in terms of the education system that we here in the U.S. just aren't doing because we can't we can't agree on what media literacy should look like or or we, we can't reach that shared reality at the moment. Is there is there anything that you feel like? we could be doing differently that we could be advocating for i mean it's it's a big question in in europe as well where like we don't have a shared european education system first of all um like every every country has their own systems and so i think there are things to be learned um from various systems around systems that teach humanities differently than, than uh, <laughs> some of the the education systems that i've been in touch with that has a deeper focus on um like critical thinking and um, within the international baccalaureate curriculum there's uh, something called the theory of knowledge i was exposed to that for a few hours a week uh, during my teenage years and i think that's fundamentally changed how i approach information in a, in a really profound and healthy way and so um i i would uh suggest looking to to international systems like that as well that really kind of values the philosophy of how we are understanding the world um both from an individual and from a societal perspective um in a different way than just uh teaching you the strange facts of uh, uh, what a social science teacher might uh, be interested in teaching that week. Right. So, yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's a tough thing to figure out. So you mentioned going back a little ways in 2017 in an interview, why the world needed to pay more attention to the radicalization of white men. Yeah. And we're six years past that. And you look pretty smart. For having said that has the world listened do you think to some extent uh i felt 2017 was already a late point of of saying that obviously um we've uh, had some pretty significant terrorist attacks etc from white men before that 2011 uh was heavy on my mind at, at that time as well and what's happened since 2017 when i said that is among others uh, the the terrible terrorist attack in in Christchurch, which really changed the international discourse on extremism as a whole in many ways. The same can to some extent be said for you know the perceived victory against ISIS, um, which changed the discourse on extremism and terrorism from being solely focused on ISIS as a group to also uh, being more interested in looking other places, I think, as kind of a, a counter-extremism sector. And so those two things in combination, I think, um, had some impact. I think also um, it became uh, more evident that some things were really wrong on the right in the U.S. in particular, and that kind of culminated in, in 2021 um, in the January 6th attack, but also obviously prior to that had been uh, lingering for some time during the Trump era um, and manifested in many various brawls and kind of acts of violence as well. And then uh, that also leading into both COVID, but also um, but also the, the Black Lives Matter Summer, uh, I think call that call it that. Uh, following the, the murder of of uh, Floyd, um, and kind of all of these issues 
drawing attention to the fact that there is a real problem of racism, there's a real problem of white supremacy, there's a real problem of angry white men who are really struggling to uh, deal right. in healthy ways and do act of violently um, across the across the world really and uh, you know we've been we recently released uh, a mapping of you know, hate in New Zealand which you know also reveals that the problem is still still very much much persists uh, there even though Christchurch uh, was such an uh, important moment for the international discourse. Um, it didn't really lead to much change, uh, it seems, domestically. And so, you know, that sort of stuff poses uh, also uh, massive challenges in terms of how a country uh, grapples with the issues internally as well as uh, how they play a role in moral leadership or, or in political leadership uh, globally as well. So, yeah. Why do you think Christchurch didn't change much in New Zealand in terms of how the problem was addressed and how it seems like, you know, like what you were saying, that was a huge moment for everybody to wake up and say, wait, there's something really awful going on here. Why does it seem like not much has changed in New Zealand, do you think? So I think it became easy to recognize the problem, but uh, the problem itself is really hard to to deal with uh, in in so many ways. Um, I think we saw a similar thing in Norway following the 2011 attack. Um, What we saw in Norway in in 2011 was very public facing kind of statements from leading politicians um, about how uh, they wanted to handle the attack uh, from more or less a, a PR perspective. And then very little happened on the ground within the country leading up to um, things like the there was an uh, attack on a mosque um, in, in 2019 in Norway as well, kind of shortly after after Price Church. And so we're kind of seeing that these issues persist in these relatively small and peaceful countries um, that uh, like to speak internationally uh, from yeah. positions of, of moral leadership um, and then you know, this like ability to act on that um, internally um, falls apart to some extent. Not to say that like nothing is being done, but it takes time, it takes effort, and it takes some real knowledge uh, about how to grapple with some of these issues. And that knowledge base has really not been built. And, and kind of part of my mission is to stay to build that knowledge base, but also um, to support countries and communities in, in tackling some of that. And so some of that is manifesting through working with local municipalities and cities through um, networks like um, the Nordic Safe Cities Network, etc. Like really taking it down to the basics of like what can the local sports clubs in a weird municipality in the far north of the world uh, do to um, create a healthier community in their in their local neighborhood, and how does that affect some real change in um, the lives of individuals who could otherwise um, kind of seek out really troublesome uh, communities and go down paths of radicalization and in, in other arenas in their life? So it does bring to mind for me the idea of talking about something being done but not enough is that it it does seem like politicians will say some platitudes and and they will say the right things long enough that hopefully people will just forget or move on or they may not have to actually do anything because you know doing things is hard and changing things is hard and i had a question here about something you published in in 2016 uh titled death to the death penalty and I, I found your statistics very telling. You, you said that 88% of top criminologists in the U.S. do not believe the death penalty acts as a deterrent to homicide. 87% don't believe it affects murder rates. 75% believe the debate serves to distract from real solutions to crime problems. And, well, one, I would ask, do you, do you still think that that is the case? And in, in the U.S., has anything changed so I haven't really looked in detail at the death penalty since, since writing that, uh, but uh, I don't think much has changed there. And like the death penalty is largely kind of, um, while there's being like 
death sentence is given, um, it doesn't seem to um, really have a massive impact in terms of, of deterring people still. Um, I think the last case um, where the death penalty was uh, being used that I followed somewhat was um, with the perpetrator of the uh, shooting in Pittsburgh. But right. uh, that was so recent that we still have um, to see see what the uh, final outcomes and comes of that will be. And so um, I think it's a really outdated measure. I think it, um, it gives people some sense of justice if they don't think too much about what justice actually means to them. Um, and so this is an easy optical solution without mm-hmm. much depth in terms of actually solving the, the underlying problems. And so, yeah. Yeah, and I, I know you've talked about the importance of maintaining our humanity and really there's nothing that more obviously strips that away than the death penalty and i did want to ask if you wanted just to explain a little bit about the the importance of maintaining our humanity no matter what's occurring around us yeah it's it's one of those really challenging and, and big questions again uh of, <laughs> like we we deal some, with some real bastards sometimes right mm-hmm. some real assholes uh who uh <laughs> does some real bad shit and part of what they are trying to get us to do in doing that is falling down the trap of becoming like them i think this is it's kind of pretty persistent across various extremist communities um they're trying to escalate the conflict they're trying to get people co- to go into engaging in cycles of violence with them and uh the only way of not ending up in a cycle of violence is by uh rejecting that and by denying them to some extent the satisfaction of that as well and so like have meeting those who are are uh, seeking to take away people's humanity with um, a radical humanity to some extent, um, it forces them as well to reflect over like why they are trying to push people down that path in the first place. But also, it really allows us to preserve ourselves and not for um, us and and our perception of ourselves and and like our identity really to be dictated by these real bad guys um and so yeah there's there's a lot to unpack in there yeah Uh, but i think those are are some of the fundamental thoughts on that it does bring to mind i was just reading interviews and and things that you've said and i just think you have such a well one you you maintain so much calm and and your insight is just it's really unique it's really um i don't know it just it resonates in a way that i don't feel like others can can get to and one one thing that struck me is really important that you highlighted is the idea of of naming these men they're mostly men these perpetrators of of mass killings because I have seen, I've seen the memes, I've seen the, the, the praise, almost deification of some of these figures in far right communities. And I, and I think that just really hit me is there's been a lot of debate back and forth. Do we, do we say their name? Do we not say their name? And, and you made it very clear that we should say their name and understand that these are just people and to not make them into more than that. Yeah. No, and I think like, I grew up on Harry Potter and that was like the key takeaway from that to some extent. Like say the say the bastard's name. Like um I was very adamant about that uh, in twenty twelve and, and like the trial against Breivik of like w- we should name him. Um and also about um like not giving in to this idea of, of mythical figures, right? At the time there was a lot of, of talk about how uh Breivik must be a genius because he wrote like 2,000 pages worth of nonsense, um, <laughs> face it, mostly copy-pasted from other sources and the parts that he wrote himself pretty bad in the first place. And so, uh, and we've seen that with all of the manifesto-based uh, perpetrators of, of mass violence, right? Like, it's mostly gibberish or copy-paste or a healthy combination of the two. 
and in the media there's still been like some attempts really at like ascribing some degree of genius to these guys and i'm just like no these are loser assholes let's Mm -hmm. let's face that they're like normal guys Mm -hmm. who've been spending far too much time uh on the computers in their mother's basements um which is a stereotype as well but you know where i'm going with this um and so there's 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 uh, that element, but then also uh, playing into what we've been seeing recently with um, like various far right communities. I think Terrorgram is probably something that's been uh, right. been shamed on here before, calling some of these perpetrators saints. Uh, the kind of gamification of um, like the Chad culture and and um, like trying to live up to like kill accounts and stuff like that as like some sort of, of ideal or, or a goal within some of these communities is really um, really dangerous and we get into those really dangerous spaces um, by you know, allowing for the elevation of these figures um, to be something more in kind of our collective consciousness both inside of extremist spaces but also in the mainstream public um, and uh, we shouldn't really allow for that and we shouldn't uh, kind of fall into the trappings of, of uh, letting the media and attention etc um, surrounding uh, some of these acts of violence and with that also like the you know, secrecy surrounding names um, be an element um, that becomes um, a factor in why people would seek out that kind of notoriety right and so yeah uh, still still standing by that one yeah, well, and, and something that you you said about Brevik was that when you saw him in the courtroom, he was he was fat and pale, and he had kind of a squeaky voice. He, he just it was kind of pitiful, and I and I know I'm sure it must have been scary, and the build up in your mind is is terrifying, understandably. I mean, he he did heinous things, and all of that is true, but he's he's just a goofy guy, a weird person and don't act like it's more than that. And I, and I think that's, that's really important and people need to hear that. That also gives us like the obligation to some extent to reflect over who these guys are. And like most of them are pretty regular, normal guys on paper. And so we must use that to inquire more like within our communities, within our societies, what is it that allows these very regular, normal seeming guys to some extent to fall into these like horrendous trappings of extremist ideology, et cetera, that drives them to commit these heinous acts of violence, right? Right. The detail that just sticks out the most in my mind about Bravik is that he complained about the generation of PlayStation they gave him in jail. That's the part that's like, are you kidding me? Yeah, the part that pissed me off about that was that <laughs> I still had like the previous generation of PlayStation at the time. And I was like, dude, why are you complaining? Like, here I am, like, trying to make ends meet. <laughs> right. I only have a PlayStation 2. I don't have a PlayStation 3. Shut up. Just. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So one of the things that you mentioned in some of the interviews that you did about Brevik is that there's a different concept of forgiveness in Norwegian yeah. culture than what most people or some people would think of as this is how forgiveness works. Can you elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, yeah. So I think like, like, first of all, the idea of justice is weird and, and really culturally determined, right? And so right. one thing I, I realized uh, pretty early on was like, justice cannot be done in this particular scenario. Um, like there, there's um, no way of justifying these acts, um, and like Brevik can apologize as much as he like or be as re- rehabilitated as as uh, humanly possible, but that doesn't take away from from like the pain and suffering that he's caused. Right. What I really wanted to focus on was what that means for me and how. Um, I move on from uh, that attack with uh, like some remains of myself. And I felt like I had kind of the option of being very focused on kind of vengeance or right. being very focused on like Brevik is evil and that is shaping my life versus kind of 
forgetting about Breivik to some extent in the midst of it and like building my life in the direction I wanted to. And like, it's debatable whether I've succeeded <laughs> in that or not, seeing as I'm still here, like staring at these assholes, right? Um, but um, it's also, it was kind of important for me to, to delineate between like this ac- acceptance of what happened and what Breivik did versus like my sense of um, freedom from what happened and my sense of ability to build on from that, uh, if that makes sense. Right. Yeah. It does make me wonder, just because I, I know obviously how personal he and that event and everything that happened is for you, um, but so much of your work now is is related to countering violent extremism and and i i know that part of that is is an intervention or a a way to reach someone before they become the the worst possible version of themselves before they move towards violence or the the worst rhetoric do you do you ever wonder or or do you believe that even someone like brevik could have been reached was that possible i mean are are can everyone be be helped? Can some people just not be reached? Where do you land on that? So I've met some very bad people on paper, like people who have done terrible things that have you know, atoned for death in different ways and like have a very active relationship to their like sense of like where they are at in terms of um like all the bad stuff they had did, if that makes sense. Um, and so I think there's there's like paths towards like becoming better. And part of that is also recognizing and, and dealing with the bad stuff you've done. And so like for some people it's possible to be reached and be uh, to some extent also rehabilitated and, and kind of come out of and it's certainly possible to come out of extremist movements. Like most people who are engaged in these movements are not actually like doing that much terrible stuff. Uh, right, right. Because um, like otherwise we would uh, have a lot more work to do than what we already have. But also, yeah, I think there's there's points at which um, intervention would have been possible with Breivik. Part of the challenge with people who have done really, really bad things Um and who will have to deal with the guilt and shame, et cetera, of that as potentially a part of a of, uh, rehabilitation process is that, like, how do you carry that as a human being? Um, I, one thing I've been thinking about is, is like, Norway has a, a prison system that is geared towards rehabilitation, right? Like, Breivik's sentence is formally 21 years. We're past the midpoint, I think, at this point of that. Um he'll likely never come out again because like that is contingent on his rehabilitation and uh, he shows no sign of, of rehabilitation so far. Rather, he's been doubling down on his more kind of overt uh, neo-Nazism while in jail as evidence through his letter writing, which he still is allowed to do for some reason. Right. But also, I'm wondering whether that is a reaction to... Or, or like a self-defense mechanism almost to be able to carry the fact that he did these terrible things and he will have to live with that one way or another. And one way of living with that is uh, doubling down on the, on the kind of justification of that in his own mind. And so like, that's kind of a lost cause in my mind at this point, um, which doesn't mean that we should give up on rehabilitation for everyone, right? Like we should still be striving towards uh, making those who have done really bad things not do really bad things anymore and make the people who are on, on the trajectories towards doing some things they can never take back uh, not go down those paths in the first place. You mentioned that you do a lot of work with former extremists, with people who are either left that life or looking to leave that life. Can you tell us a little bit about what the path to de-radicalization looks like for somebody from that life? Uh, so I think this is a few few years ago. I don't work that much hands-on um, with the radicalization anymore. But 
there's a couple of common denominators, even though everyone's trajectory is, is, is very individual. And one of the most you know, common things in, in paths of the radical session is really the recognition of the human value of someone you thought you hated. So one thing we see in, in various stories of people who have left like hate-based extremist movements is that they met someone from the group they had defined that they hated and the people who they had defined that they hated uh, met them with um, kind of unconditional love or like an unconditional recognition of their value as human beings even though they recognized that they were being hated by them if that makes sense right and so in that there is the element where like when someone meets you with radical humanity you kind of are forced to reflect that as a human being it's it's how we function as societies to some extent and in that there are you know, incredible power for being a trigger point in the radical decision process now that doesn't mean that like that is the be all end all of, of those processes it's more um a potential uh, kind of turning point in someone's life. And one thing that we've worked on is kind of constructing that and and making those points happen for people in different ways. And, and, and that's been, been somewhat helpful. But then there's also a bunch of kind of very practical things attached to bringing people out of extremist movements, um, including like, the criminal justice side of it uh, is one element, but also like the practicalities of like finding a new job, like just being able to make a living outside of like a, a extremist economy uh, right. or like often like gang or, or criminal economy to some extent, right? Making a new social network where like extremist networks tend to like pull people in and try to replace everything surrounding an individual so they pull people away from their families they pull people away from their old friends um etc and a part of that is also like a lot of people at least on kind of the more conventional neo-nazi far right side of things try to some extent to become as ob- objectionable as possible as kind of human beings as a way of just being distant from society in in some way um, and so it's like, how do you rebuild that kind of social infrastructure surrounding uh, surrounding an individual? And, you know, there's uh, a lot of hurdles surrounding that, including also safety and protection from your former crew, etc. Right. Yeah, so much of it seems to rely on interpersonal relationship, contact, just, just speaking. I know we've had several people on the show that we've asked that question of how do you reach someone who's going down the path of radicalization? And so much of it is just talk to them about their favorite sports team or their hobby. Just, just be their friend, be a person. And we're all so terminally online that we forget that because it, it seems quaint or silly or but it, it it is the most basic thing and and we all need that we need that personal touch yeah and i think like part of it is like attaching more to the person than like just a label that you're putting on them right like this person is a neo-nazi but you know he's also a fan of manchester united so like tell them about how you're a big fan of manchester city and have your argument about that rather than <laughs> uh about something else and like enter into like human discussions um that go beyond just the labels and then like bit by bit you can get at at that as well and start kind of working towards having some of those deeper conversations about like well you do believe in these really problematic things let's let's talk about that right right yeah, yeah. they're not going to believe that you want to talk to them about any of the other stuff if they don't believe that you at least care about them on some level as a human being first yeah So what's something that you feel that average people who aren't necessarily knee deep in this research or knee deep in this space can do to make their own sort of community, their own area less prone to this kind of thing? What's, what's something that an average person can do? I think showing up is 
like the starting point, right? Like just in your local community, like be be active, be a person. One thing that we had in like Oslo where where I grew up was um like groups of parents would basically like patrol the streets um Friday nights and Saturday nights in particular, like making sure that like all of the kids were like being yeah. reasonably safe and like it wasn't law enforcement. Um it was like civilian parents who, who right. did this um and i think like that kind of engagement um at kind of a really civic level um and just being present and being visible like as adults in particular in local communities is really um important and provides like a sense of safety um even where there is distrust in for instance law enforcement and so like that is really important um uh, being part of things like local sports team local um initiatives at the local library um all of those things are, are really important showing up to local school board meetings and telling some of the people who are disturbing those these days uh, in the us for instance off would be really helpful like participating in local democratic institutions is, is really valuable as kind of saying people so i encourage sane people to do that. Uh, um <laughs> the other side of that is obviously like a lot of us are chronically online um and so are our, our kids and like young people uh, today and so being that kind of like visible trustworthy person online as well i think becomes increasingly important and um one model that i've been like toying with lately is like how do we make like the same type of like neighborhood like groups of trustworthy adults who who walk around and like are safe guardians basically um on the friday nights and saturday nights and also how do we make those be on you know um Fortnite? uh right. how do we uh make them be on minecraft like how do we put them into like these spaces where like we see uh a lot of um recruitment in particular of very young people mm -hmm. um, into more and more hardline extreme spaces like and part of that is like the adults who are there are trying to recruit them <laughs> that's a problem yeah. Um, yeah so like there should be also a presence of like responsible people within those spaces and so like that's part of, like i've been speaking to to members on my um team uh who who are parents about like how they also participate in like their their kids uh gaming activities and i think there's like really healthy ways of doing that and like that also becoming you know family bonding and and, and all of that as well and so uh, yeah translating some of some of our like civic activities offline into the online world as well is, is uh, a next step there oh, i think that's a really great idea and i i like to remind myself and think of this as we can't control people's actions, but we can nudge someone. And if sometimes it, if you had that intervention, that nudge early on with a with a kid, with a, your child or someone who you knew and you could tell them, hey, your 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 son is is watching these videos or he's really, you know, he's using this terminology that's problematic. And if you could just nudge them into saying, maybe don't do that or here's why that's a problem. Here's why. This is not okay. That that could make the world a difference. Yeah. So the nudging thing is one element, but it's like if the only people feeding information into the spaces are like actively trying to recruit people in right. movements, then like that's a real problem. But also, if a kid is encountering uh, attempts at recruitment or like uh, really harm harmful or like um, damaging stuff on the platforms, um, and the only people they can speak to about it are the people who are promoting and sharing that right. uh, that's a real problem right like they should be able to go to someone else and be like hey i saw this video promoting white supremacy or like whatever uh, and they should be able to like go to a trusted individual within the community and like say hey um what is this can you like explain this thing and like that in itself doesn't necessarily have to be like nudging as much as just being someone who can provide context outside of the groups that are, are actively recruiting on these platforms right right yeah we had a gentleman on not too long ago by the name of luke bernard who built a holocaust museum in Fortnite, 
And yeah. he took more flack from the Nick Fuentes online set for that than you would believe possible because all of a sudden this is a space that they thought of as like, this is where we recruit. And next thing you know, it's somebody they don't want to see is here talking about things that they would like to minimize in the middle of yeah. what they thought was their space. Kind of really fascinating one would piss off the people in like the frame of expression crowd. <laughs> oh, it absolutely <laughs> did. Hey, it's like he's he's expressing yeah. himself. What's the problem here? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, and and he was Luke was so great because he was talking about Fortnite and these other games where he he actually talks to the developers and says, "Hey, here's what's happening here." He's personally gone in and observed Nazi symbols in in Minecraft and. The, the ways that they are creatively sharing and spreading this. And I know part of what you do is understanding that and tracking that. And I don't think if the, maybe the, the developers are too old and, and not on their platform enough, but it really, you need someone who's, who's in it day after day. You have to live it because these kids are living it and it's constantly evolving and changing. It's not static. So they're trying to beat the system. And I don't think there's enough awareness of the need for, yeah, someone who, who is always there and watching and knows what to look out for and understands the meaning of the things that are occurring. Yeah, but we're increasing well like a bunch of adults who are like, we grew up with games and we're gamers, right? And so like, there's that element of it. And for quite some time there, it was like the research community in particular that was like researching violent extremism was always like, oh, if you're playing World of Warcraft, you're going to become a Nazi mass shooter, which obviously, statistically, not really true. <laughs> and right, so, right. Like, we're, we're now, like, living in this world where, like, half the population is by some way or another uh, a fairly active gamer, right? Like, whether you play on your phone or whether you play on, like, uh, a massive gaming rig or whatever, like, we're all playing computer right. games. And, and somewhere or another, the computer games are, like, more and more uh, interconnected and also, like, merging over into, like, social media platforms in different ways. And so, like, we're there as adults, but also as, like, researchers in this space at this point in a very different way than we were just a few years ago. And I think that really provides, like, a massive opportunity here for, for working more healthily within those spaces, right? Yeah, absolutely. So... What can people do to support you and your work? So uh, they can have our services from Glitterpill. Um, we work a lot with private sector companies these days on how to protect themselves from, from violent extremism in different ways, whether it's um, like people internally who are being recruited into uh, extremist movements, whether it's like physical threats towards infrastructure or locations, but also, obviously, to uh, those who are providing convening spaces, uh, whether those convening spaces are offline or online, we're helping them out in understanding how those spaces are being abused by, by extremist actors. And so um, if you are interested in that kind of services, let us know. There's also the work on the Khalifa Island Institute side of things, which is uh, kind of our nonprofit. Part of what we're doing there is rebuilding basically from the ground up the hit map. We've uh, recently started kind of putting out uh, hitmap.io, which is the new home for that. Uh, we're looking for partner organizations, people who are mapping extremism in their uh, local contexts in, in different ways to help uh, contribute with uh, the data backing that one up. But obviously also always interested in finding meaningful partnerships and ways uh, to keep the lights on and right. keep, keep that funded in different ways. And so rich people, people <laughs> working for foundations, etc. cetera, uh, our contact form is, is always open. We're also incredibly happy to share the word and spread the word about uh, this effort. So amplification of that also always helps. So, yeah. Those are a few of the ways, at least at this point. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent. Well, Bjorn, thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. We really appreciate your perspective and we really appreciate the work you're doing. So thank you very much. And you have a great rest of your day. Okay. Oh, well, thank you so much for having me. And uh, likewise, have a, have a great day. Thanks, Bjorn. Take care. Thanks, Bjorn. Thank you. Thanks for listening to the Did Nothing Wrong podcast. If you want to hear more, you can find us on the web at didnothingwrongpod.com. Please make sure you subscribe to get our content straight into your inbox. 
You can also follow us on Twitter at James, the word for, and the letter M, all one word, and Grizza BJJ, G-R-Z-A-B-J-J, as well as DNW Pod. We're extremely grateful for paid subscriptions and donations that allow us to keep doing this important work. Thanks, and remember, everyone mentioned did nothing wrong.